Hello, and welcome back to the Free Outside Podcast. I had a couple of episodes go out while I was in the middle of nowhere doing a stage race. So let's do a recap on that stage race. It was brutal. Here we go. So the stage race, it was 171 miles through Arizona and Utah. It went from the Grand Canyon to Grand Staircase Escalante, and hence the name Grand to Grand. So the trick for me going into the stage race, and I did an episode on this, you can go back and listen, was packing. So I packed more like a fast packing trip, but I didn't really realize pretty much anything. I wasn't even totally sure if we had to carry our food for the whole thing. We did, turns out. And I took a light sleeping uh, quilt and a foam sleeping pad, which ended up working pretty good. Some people's sleeping pads broke. But let's just get into it. Here is the full recap of the experience. And spoiler alert, I was able to come out with second place, which I'm pretty proud of. It was really brutal. I learned a lot. I didn't show up with quite everything I would have if I was, I guess, totally experienced, knowing what I was doing, um, all that. So here's how it went. So I went down to Kanab, and that's kind of where the the hub, where it started and finished, at least where they bust us from and to at the end. And there was a gear check. So I showed up. I brought my pack. I was using this new pack that Hyperlight came up with, came out with, the Aero 28 liter, which turns out probably a little bit bigger than I needed to use on this. It didn't carry perfect for so many running miles, but I wasn't even sure the terrain. I didn't look at the elevation stats or anything. After a DNF at Wasatch 100, I just kind of skated into this, trying to embrace the adventure and not worry too much about logistics and results. I did have to get a medical clearance form actually from my doctor that I was fit to run this race. So I figured it would be somewhat serious. Some of the things that you had to have was like a signal mirror. They checked that you had two different headlamps, a flashing light for the back of your pack, um, sleeping bag that was rated for the the correct temperature, uh, rain jacket, insulated jacket. So they checked all this stuff and then they weighed in your whole pack plus your food. You also had to have 1.5 liters of capacity. And for the food, that was the tough part for me. It was going to be six stages over seven days, but really when you count, uh, you could carry out breakfast for the first day and you could eat it before you'd have to go. And the last day would finish before noon. It was about six days of food that I planned out. So I initially put them all in Ziploc bags, like a gallon Ziploc, so that each day was separated. And I had two, like between 2.2 and 2.5 pounds of food. So that's about a kilogram or 1.1 kilograms of food for all our uh, Canadian listeners, A, eh? sorry. But that was the hard part. I was comparing my food to what other people had out there. It felt like I might've had too much. So I dropped a little bit last minute before we boarded the buses. So I ended up maybe, let's see, my whole pack was probably 19 pounds right around there, a little heavier than I probably should have taken. Um, some things I could have cut down on were headlamps. Uh, I had nice headlamps. Turns out we only needed them for like four or five hours of the entire thing. So my backup headlamp should have been just super lightweight and basically not even usable. That would have cut down, I don't know, close to a pound and I could have taken a lighter primary headlamp too, since it wasn't something super necessary. And I see pretty good in the dark, the pleasure of being colorblind. So we stay in a hotel, the Perry Lodge in Kanab, Utah, and get up the next morning and the buses take us, they give us a sack lunch and the bus takes us to the edge of the Grand Canyon where we camp. There's a spaghetti dinner uh, they announced some of the rules, how the course is marked, and you can see the Grand Canyon. It's a pretty epic first night camp spot. And we get out there, and that's when I turn my phone off completely. I'm not going to use it for the rest of the week. I did write some notes in it. Just I like to, so my whole career, we can call it since I guess I do make money in this uh, niche industry. Every adventure, even if it's at FKT, I try to write like, three to five bullet points, even more sometimes about each day out there so that I can write about it, blog about it, or just remember what happens each day. And that's the only reason I use my phone out there this time. So spaghetti feed, 
tell us all this stuff, and then we go to bed. And immediately I realize it's going to be hard. Everyone's snoring. We haven't even gone anywhere yet, and like three members of my tent are snoring quite loud. I did not bring earplugs that said it was recommended on the gear list, but I figure I can't sleep very well with earplugs, so what's the point of bringing them? I did scrunch up some tissue paper and put it in my ears. So that helped a little that first night, but from then I had to make changes and we'll get into that. Okay, wake up the next morning and they play trumpets. And since I had to listen to this every morning, you get to too. So here is the song that they played. So that's what they played every morning for us to wake up. It was pretty terrible because we didn't start any of the stages until 8 a.m. And this would be playing at 6 a.m. So everyone would be getting up, packing up. And my true nature is I have very modular packing system, very easy. I can always be packed up in about five minutes. And so I had another hour and 55 minutes to sit around and basically do nothing. And so I brought a little bit of instant coffee just it i didn't have it for every day it devolved into they provided hot water and regular water it was not cold because it would be roasting in plastic jugs and the heat so that's what they provided you had to provide pretty much everything else and they also provided these big tents kind of like canvas tents i guess that size six people per tent and when people dnf'd or dropped out they would be gone. So that tent would open up. And by the end, there were some tents with, I think, only three or four people in them. Okay. Day one, we wake up to that awesome, awesome trumpet uh, blaring. And then we sit around and wait. And we show up at the start line at 730 because they want to take some photos. And then there's a course briefing on the day. And then they say go. And we start running a road. I started off running with Uh, Michael from Poland and Matt Graham, who actually helped develop the Hyperlight pack. He was the other one carrying the Arrow 28. And I saw Muriel, a Frenchman who had won the race before and has done really good at a number of stage races around the world because this this is like a global race style in most of the deserts. There's one, there's Marathon de Saab, which is the big one that a lot of people have heard of. There's Atacama. There's, I don't know, like 20 more. There's some people I met out there who were doing, one guy, Inya, was doing seven stage races on seven continents in one year. So that's pretty crazy because they're all like 150 to 200 miles and over a week and expensive to get to. He's doing one on Antarctica. So that's pretty wild. Okay. We take off. Muriel is like, 100 yards ahead within the first quarter mile. And I'm like, okay, I got to at least test myself and see if I can make this work. I have 19 pounds on my back. I strapped in the hip belt at the last minute. I took out the hip belt that came with the pack and I attached a Gossamer gear hip belt that is, uh, what do you call it? Modular. You can uh, take it. I could take it off the original pack and I connected it to my arrow. So I strapped that on and I started running after him. I chased him down and flew through the first aid station. I think I did like 5.3 miles in 48 minutes, which is much too fast with so much weight on your back. I was feeling it in my shoulder, especially my left shoulder. It's just right around the capacity of that pack and probably not what that, or at least the weight capacity, but probably not what that pack is designed to carry when you're running. So it has a uh, front little harness system, like a running vest where it can hold the bottle. So it worked pretty good for fueling and hydrating with all the pockets, but overall it was a tough first couple days until I ate down some food. So chased him down, flew through aid stations. All of this was on dirt roads. So it was pretty, pretty easy and tame to keep a good flow. It was very flat for the start. And then around mile 23 and we'll call it 26, about a marathon in it left the true roads and started going cross country. And there's these little pink flags with polka dots on them, almost like you'd see at a construction site or something like that. And this is what we followed. It would just go straight through the cacti and then we crossed a 
highway. And at that point I was cooked. It's like 85, 87 degrees. It was the coolest day. So it was just below 90, but this cross country travel, there's cacti. Every step has to matter or you're going to chew up your feet. I just started hiking and I had a lot of trouble seeing these pink flags. I'm colorblind and pink's a tough color, especially blended into the wilderness. So I had a tough time there. I lost the flags, probably lost 20 minutes on that first day and fo finally followed in the fence line, finished out the day. It was a 50K, so 31 miles that first day in maybe a little over six hours is what it took me. So that puts me at what's called 2.30. I was like an hour behind Muriel, who uh, was in first and he would never look back. He was very fit, very good at running um, the flats and also probably had like, I don't know, eight or nine pounds less than me at this point. But he he was a crusher, so I couldn't keep up. I kind of learned, well, I'm pretty slotted, probably into second, so let's just have some fun, try to embrace the experience. So it's 2.30. I cook my meal, uh, which means just adding hot water. I brought a cup, actually, just like a hard plastic cup, and that was going to be my bowl, my coffee cup, I guess, my drinking cup. And I was also going to use it when I got to aid stations to fill up, take a couple sips of water from, and then topical cool because there was nothing set up for topical cooling at these aid stations. It was just water that they provided because it was all self-supported. So you had to carry everything you're going to eat, all your electrolytes for six and a half, seven days. So pretty wild. Got there, hanging out, a little cooked, like, wow, I really ran my legs hard today. And then Matt Graham comes in and Michael, who I'd run some with, and we kind of bonded. We sat there and this is when they weighed, excuse me, they weighed in our food to check that we had the right amount left. So basically how it worked for food is at the end of every stage, they would weigh you in and you had to have basically half a kilogram per day of food left over. So if there's six days left, you'd have to have three kilograms of food. If there's one day left, you'd have to have half a kilogram of food. And for our imperial listeners, that's 1.1 pounds of food. So this was tricky because it was like, well, I initially have too much. So I figured that was like this moment when I'm weighing it in and realize I have four, five pounds of just food more than uh, Muriel, who's very competitive um, or who I wanted to be competitive with, didn't have any chance. But I figured I needed to eat down my food quick. It was going to be the easiest way for me to control what I have. And since I don't want to get rid of any gear or I really can't and still hit the requirements, my only method is going to be eating. So I took it as a challenge to eat really, I'll call it eat hard the first two days. So I consumed a lot of calories, probably like 4,500. I packed I dropped a little bit um, leading into the race, so I'd say I had like 3,500 per day, but for the first couple days I ate a thousand more. I was taking extra food out of future days to try to just lighten the load. And so you sit around, everyone comes in slowly, you're eating, you're filling your water, setting out your sleeping system, all that stuff, and by 8 p.m. I think is the cutoff, the last runner comes in, and then there's a fire going, people are chatting, and then it, Eventually, everyone goes off to bed. You're going to have to do it again tomorrow. So go to bed, more snoring, but I'm more prepared. I put tissue in my ears. Everything was good enough. So the next day happens and, you know, we get that just beautiful, beautiful morning wake up because, you know, that's uh, how it goes in this thing. And then they play some good old, like, 90s 2000s music really loud on the speaker and wake everyone up it's not my favorite way to wake up especially since i can usually sleep till the last minute but pack really quickly again and then i just sit around and wait for the day to start it's tough because the best times to be logging miles in the desert are early in the morning and we just had to watch those hours tick by and wait for the hotter times to to uh be running so 8 a.m. Uh, after a quick briefing, the adventure starts again. Today is a, let's see, it was a 26-mile day, and so we took off. This time it was completely off-trail, well, quite off-trail, maybe hint of game trail, and there's just these flagging. So I stuck with Matt and Michael again. Matt was not colorblind. Michael was also colorblind, 
And so we uh, had trouble seeing him, but Matt could pick up the uh, flagging. And it was kind of runnable, but well, it was off trail, but it was flat. So it was pretty runnable. And my pack was just like still uncomfortably heavy at this point. My legs are a little sore from running too hard and running too flat yesterday. This whole summer, I've not done a lot of flat running. So it was not the most conducive to this race where there were countless flat miles, uh, some climbing. There was 170, no, there was 17,000 feet of gain over 171 miles. But I really, if I wanted to do my best, I probably would have practice more flat running to take advantage of that. So there was this cross country section, we ran it and then we climbed straight uphill. It was kind of nice actually to have a hiking section. I powered through it. I took off. I was quite a bit ahead of Michael and uh, Matt, who I guess became friends just from spending so much time together and got to the top of the hill huffing and puffing and then kind of took it easy i settled into maybe 12 13 minute pace and michael comes up behind me and we're running together and soon we turn onto this dirt road after a little bit and just chatting along and then he goes have you seen a marker in a while and it was like uh nope uh uh-oh and he was like well there's a gate up there they always mark the gate so we ran up to the gate and there was no marker turned around, had to run all the way back down that road. And we lost probably about a mile and a half, like three quarters of a mile out and three quarters of a mile back just because we couldn't find the ribbons. We got back on track. We found the last uh, marker, turned left, followed that into the second aid station where I was so distraught and disappointed. I, we crossed the Arizona trail right before this aid station. And I was thinking like, man, I could just turn onto this Arizona trail, hike that across the Grand Canyon into like Flagstaff. I have enough food. I could have my own adventure and not have to worry about this. I'm so frustrated because we have no GPS on a phone to follow. The map in the course book was pretty rugged. So you couldn't really use a map and compass on that, even though they required a compass. I was just very frustrated. I was very low. I got to the aid station and saw my friend Derek, who was making a video of the race and just was like, man, I hate this. This is no fun. I can't see these markers. I just burned like 20 minutes going the wrong way. I'm just frustrated and tired. I don't even know if I want to be here, but you know, I'm pretty stubborn. So I kept going. I ran pretty good on the flats. I made up some ground and was really logging nine minute miles again with now the pack's probably down to 17 pounds. It's still pretty heavy, but being in a bad mood, I was able to just turn that into some forward miles and I caught back up to Matt. We joined together and then just kind of chatted. We uh, had a good day. It got hotter and hotter. It was pretty flat, but very runnable. There were some uh, like cruiser downhill grades like on uh, dirt for once, not sand. And so we were like hammering these out. We were feeling really good. Filled up at the aid stations, kept going. Then I hit a low point and I was just like, man, I think I burned all my matches today. I started walking. I was like, you go ahead. Maybe I'll catch up. Maybe I won't. He went ahead and that's when it was just like a pity party. I let myself have one for maybe five minutes where I was just hiking along thinking like, man, this is rough. I don't like that I'm doing this. I feel disconnected. I'm very stressed with work stuff and outside stuff going on that I don't think I'm going to really be able to embrace this experience. And then it was finally like, all right, snap out of it. You have this opportunity to do this stage race. I need to just buckle down and try to find some joy in this activity that I'm doing. So I saw Matt like maybe a quarter mile ahead at this point. It was like, I can definitely catch him. So I put the hammer down. I didn't put the hammer down. It was like running, let's call it 12 or 13 minute miles, but consistently through the ups and the downs, just like running really well to effort level, even with the heavier pack and just being really consistent with trying to catch up. So I knocked off, you know, a few meters at a time. I'm talking in, uh, in standard now, uh, I knocked off a little bit of it at a time, caught up to him. And then it was like six hot miles to the end. And we just agreed to do like a run walk. It was very exposed. We'd exited the trees when we did that gentle downhill. And it was in this long exposed, uh, dirt road where the sun's beating down. It's probably 90, 91 today. It's uh, about 2 p.m. We know the general direction the camp is. It's not windy, so there's nothing breaking up the heat. I'm not feeling that good. I don't know if Matt's feeling that good, but we're just like slowly knocking off the miles. We're pretty content. 
we're going to get tie for second place or something. So we just kind of chat and I was picking his brain. He was on uh, this show that I watched in college actually called Dual Survival where they drop him and like a ex-military guy off. He's uh, He lives in Escalante, Utah, Matt does, and teaches classes on like living off the land and ancient techniques and edible plants and survival skills, stuff like that. So that's really cool. So he was telling me about some of the plants. We were chatting about things like that just to pass the time. And I was finally like, how do you turn your mind around when you really don't want to be doing something because this is tough for me and we just had a good discussion on how just embracing that we decided to be out here we signed up for doing this whole race and that I should just try to do my best to get through it so that's what we did uh kind of during a little bit before this we were running pretty hard and Matt slipped and fell and he cut up his hand pretty good so he had a nasty gash he was working with dripping blood so we were quite the sight but we kind of run, walked, and then jogged slowly into the finish, and uh, that was day two. Now we're 56 miles in, two days, and with this, it means the long stage is starting tomorrow. And that means that it's 53 miles, and it goes overnight for most people. Well, at least into the night. This is why you had to have night stuff and uh, multiple headlamps and stuff. So this is when it was like, okay... With this long stage looming, I have to drop some weight. So I ate two dinners. I ate probably two pounds of food in this time from when this stage ended and the next one began. Uh, And this is when I found out that they staggered the starts on the long stage. So that means that the slower people started at 8 a.m., the standard time, but we weren't going to start until 10 a.m. So we were going to start in the heat of the day. We'd have to go through the full heat of the day and then deep into the night after we'd you know, cooked ourselves by running hard in the heat of the day. It was tough, not the best news, because once again, you want to take advantage of those early morning hours when you're in the desert, but whatever. So it camped this evening. It was like, okay, I need to embrace something about this race. It looks like I'm probably not going to be able to get first. First place has everything dialed. He's done like 20 of these stage races, but it was like, I think I have a pretty good, decent shot at getting second. I'm pretty slotted in there in case, unless I make a big mistake. So how am I going to find some fulfillment and enjoyment? I don't have a book. I'm not going to use my phone. So what's left? Well, probably the 60 other people in the race to just talk to. So I talked to a guy from New Zealand who's doing the seven stage races on seven continents this year. I talked to a woman from Australia, Kate, who is done a number of these uh, stage races before and got to hear their stories. It was fun because, you know, everyone out there is void of distractions of a phone. And so you have these really in-depth conversations pretty quickly. And with so many different cultures, there were like 13 countries represented. It was pretty cool to just hear the background of people. It was a good way to lean into embracing something about the race that wasn't just performance or miles because most days I'm only running six hours a day. So it was pretty hard to put much self-worth into only six out of the 24 hours. So I talked with them, the New Zealand uh, Inya a guy told me how he was raising money and wanted to start a charity about getting uh, troubled youth into stage racing because it gave such a tremendous amount of accomplishment to himself and just talking. I don't know. It, it's a weird thing. Just being vulnerable. Even the camp crew was fun to talk to, just getting to know everyone, what brought them out there, why they wanted to do a stage race. And yeah, that's kind of what I latched onto for, I had like five more days and I was pretty disappointed in the style and how hard it was going to be for me because you're on someone else's schedule. So you wake up at six, you start at eight and then you finish and it's just like, and you can't go anywhere. You have to stay at camp within a hundred yards of camp. And it's just like, I, I don't know. I'm really into freedom, having a flexible life. And you give it all up when they literally weigh your food and you have to have all these requirements. Like there's rules. If you left a piece of gear behind, it adds an hour to your time. Um, if you're, if you drop a piece of trash, it's like 30 minutes to your time. There's all sorts of rules out there. If you don't have enough food, then it's like an hour added to your time. So it was wild. And so this is when night three decided I needed to change something up. I wasn't sleeping that good, didn't like the tent. So I just didn't go in the tent. 
I decided I was going to sleep out under the stars. I went 100 yards, 50 yards from camp maybe, set up my sleeping bag, and just slept under the stars, got got that back. And then when the trumpets went off in the morning, I just hung there. I didn't need two hours, so I just sort of laid there and let my body rest a little more. I was certainly tired going into the long day, but I mean, it was going to be a 50-mile day. That's where I thrive. It's my favorite distance. So I knew how to pace that. I knew I was going to be good. So we just sat around and it was so hot. It was getting hotter and hotter. Watched the first wave leave at eight. And then we left at 10 and it was like, it's going to be a hot one. It was also going to be sandy. So we ran, they say go. And then we ran this dirt road for eight miles to the first aid station and then climbed right up above Kanab uh, and then followed a series of really, really sandy roads. I just ran with Matt and Michael pretty much step for step on this whole section. And I think we just subtly made a silent pack. Let's just do this day together. There's no reason to do anything special. It's a long day. It's hot out there. So I ran with Matt, all of it. And Michael was usually around uh, as we were running through a cross country section. Once again, no trail and just some ribbons to follow. Matt's our guide because he's the only one that could see him. Matt's like, oh, eat some of these berries. They're like, get in. So we just all three of us went down into the water, laid in it, cooled off. It was so nice and refreshing. And then filled up our water, got back to business, climbed up the hill, and then trotted on. Day kind of turned to night, running very sandy roads, uh, navigating. We pulled out the headlamps. And then this is when we hit this sandy expanse that led to coral pink sand dunes. And yes, we went across the dunes. And when I say sand, I don't mean like light sand. I mean like the really soft sand at the top part of a beach. What the top part? I mean like the furthest away from the water where like your feet sink in and you can only move really slow. This is what hung me up more than anything. I think Mariel, who very good at these races, had done so many and trains in the sand that he was just really equipped for running in it. I didn't have gaiters or anything. Everyone else had gaiters to keep sand out. I just let my feet fill up with it and dumped it out at the each checkpoint. But yeah, the sand, it took everything out. So we turned across the sand dunes and they had these markers. They had little, some of them had like reflectors or LED lights. So you could see them. I could see them better at night than the day actually. And it was like they picked every big dune. I think it was for four miles there was sand dunes. So we got to the first one, climbed it up, and it was like, man, this is going to be annoying with my shoes. So eventually, me and Matt just took our shoes off. And then after another dune, there were like probably 13 of these high dunes, a couple hundred feet high, over four miles, and really, really taxing, expansive, soft sand. We just were like, all right, let's take our socks off too. So we went without socks or shoes across the expanse of the sand dunes. And as we got near the... I think it's the northern end of the state park or the the route there. That's the area that everyone visits. So there were footprints everywhere. Before that, we could kind of track people. Like a few of the people who'd started earlier were still ahead. We could track their footprints. But with so many here, we couldn't track them. And we couldn't find a marker. It was pretty windy. So a lot of them were blowing down or people would run over them with their sand buggies or they just got messed up in some way. So we couldn't find them. And we just lost them. So we spread out, looked for them. Then we found the track. And this is when uh, Michael and Matt were like, yeah, I think we got to go this way. And it was, I was like, so sure that we'd already been that way. Cause you know, like there's where you come from and where you're going. And we got back to the straight line perpendicular, perpendicular. And it was like, kind of lost sense of direction of which way we needed to go. And I, on top of not taking a phone, I didn't take a watch on this uh, either. I wanted to just fully immerse myself, no headphones, no watch, no phone. And it was like, well, I don't have any tools, guys, but I'm pretty sure we actually go the other way. And, it, and then it was like, okay, let's pull out our course book and see if we can make sense of the map and use a compass. We did, but at this point on the route, it does a circle, so like a little figure U shape, and it was really small, so it was hard to tell where on that we were. So after some discussion, we finally decided to go the way I thought we needed to. And once we looked at the track on one of their watches, it was like, okay, we nailed it. We're going the right way. Continued through the heavy sand, put our shoes back on, got to the checkpoint where it's like midnight or something. And we have like maybe eight miles to go and it's all going to be pretty sandy. 
fill up water and they're like, you want to sleep or anything? And it's like, no way, dude, we got it. We got to close this thing out. So step for step, we kept going. The sand turned, turned into cross country, uh, where like cacti were just everywhere. There were star thistle, which are like go heads. If, uh, if you know what those are in the desert, they got all over our socks in our socks and shoes. Michael had gaiters, so he was pretty safe, but Matt had cut the front of his shoes out to save his uh, toes, which he jammed in the Grand Canyon training for this. So they were getting all up in his shoes. They were coming in the tops of mine. It was pretty annoying. And not to mention with no trail, you're just seeing these markers, but you're having to decide which way to go around each cacti when you get to it or each piece of sagebrush. It was pretty miserable for one in the morning, but we kept a good enough pace and then Got to the next sandy road and led us to the checkpoint. Last one, it's only like three or four miles to the finish. So Philip watered and was like, all right, guys, we got to close this out. So I took the lead and pushed us. I think we mostly hiked it, but I kept like a four mile an hour hiking pace. Both the guys were getting pretty sleepy. I was tired too, but I was feeling more alert and ready to close this thing out. So I set a really good pace. They latched on and we just powered up that hill got into the finish at like 2 a.m. after like a 17-hour, 53-mile day with uh, some bonus miles mixed in there too because that's what it's all about. And we were set, had a quick, let's see, a quick dinner maybe. I think I just had like a pinch of some food because the next day is an off day. Well, it basically means like people have until the end of that next day to finish and it takes some of them that whole time but that meant for us it was going to be an empty day so this would have been started sunday monday tuesday this would have been wednesday so go to sleep wake up seven or so when a big chunk of people come in and kind of groggy was able to take a little bit of a nap and then just like sat around most of the day it was kind of hard like you don't have anything to do except eat so i tried to eat down even more food. And then I got to where I was wondering, do I have too little food left over? Like I've eaten 4,500 to 5,000 calories a day for like three days, probably eaten like probably seven or eight pounds of food now. And I have to weigh in with like three pounds of food, I think at the end of the, or 2.2 pounds of food at the end of the next stage. So I was a little nervous about where I would be and lose an hour. So I actually asked, there's a the guy who does all the rules, the race commissioner, Garth, I was like, can I weigh in my food just to see if I'm good? So I weighed it in. I had three pounds left and it was like, okay, now that I've eaten my food down to like a much more comfortable weight to carry, I can run better. But this also means I got to be really smart with calories and consuming over the next, over the next three stages. So get through that day. Uh, Matt actually threw a prickly pear a pad on his hand and that is a holistic natural form of healing up your hand so learn something out there too so every well i think i think there'd been like one dnf one uh dropout until this day and on this day there were like 12 or 14 or something so most people dropped on the long day so go to sleep wake up and then it's time to do another marathon day Day five. Oh, also on the off day, after the last runner finished, there was a surprise, and they gave us a surprise. I don't really want to ruin it. It was it was some calories. It was it was refreshing. We'll go with that. Okay, go to sleep. Wake up. Day five. Still sleeping outside. And this is when I have three pounds of food, and I need it to be over two point two pounds when I get weighed in that night. So. I kind of budgeted out like three gels is what I could eat. And then I had a dinner for that night, a smaller dinner because I'd eaten all my heavy stuff. So I ran with Cade, Michael, and Matt. It was very runnable first start to the day. Like sand was gone. It was like hard packed, really runnable roads. And we were cooking like probably 10 minute mile average, even with maybe 1200 feet of gain through this day. And everyone still has a pretty big pack. It was pretty cool to have a group of four and just be chatting. And then it, quickly got hot around the halfway point we heard i think i hit halfway in like two hours and 20 minutes so that would have been 13 miles in or something and this is with a pack of course i keep reminding you that and got to this uh, aid station mile 14 fill up water fill up my cup dump it on myself and then it's like time to keep going michael's ahead of me he's cooking to death but then i saw him come up behind me right after this aid station and he'd taken a wrong turn because 
we can't see these flags. Colorblind sucks. So ran pretty good, but uh, he took off. It was like a really sandy, hot climb, probably the hottest day, maybe 92, 93. And I was just kind of in the self-preservation mode. I had a pretty good lead for second place, a pretty good lead on third place and pretty far back of first. So it was kind of slotted where I was going to be. I just needed to be pretty smart. So I ran everything I could run. I hiked pretty hard on the sandy sections, but you just can't move very fast when it's sandy. Your feet just sink in and it feels like you're just pushing a, a weight uphill or something like two steps forward, one step back is always the joke. Uh, we went uh, through like Diana's throne. It was really quick, but hot day. And you finished with like three miles on a really runnable, slightly downhill paved asphalt road. And I just could have hammered it, but I just did not have it in me. So I ran pretty slow, turned in the finish and was done. My legs were pretty tired. Uh, just, I think built up fatigue and all the flat runnable miles really affected me more than the hiking and stuff that I've been doing with the mountains of Montana. So I was pretty tired, uh, weighed in my food. I think I had 2.7 pounds, so I barely ate anything. These last couple, uh, three days or so, I probably averaged like seven to 800 calories per day, really bad, but it was part of my strategy to get the pack weight down and have the running feel better. So we just waited around. Everyone finished pretty quick on this day because it was flatter, faster. It was hot though. So the heat management was always an issue. I brought back my old strategy. Of, I use my John G visor and then I have this bandana. It's actually a Sawyer bandana, shout out Sawyer, that I put around it just to like cover my neck and then I could pour water on top and wet the bandana. So pretty good with topical cooling. I hadn't done that in a while since probably through hiking. So it was good to use some of those old strategies and then uh, went to bed. It was a uh, camp was set up in this old corral that I think the BLM had graded for them, but that just meant they'd like moved around all the thistle and stuff and all the cow poop and pee. So it smelled kind of bad, but I tucked away in the very corner by the fence under a tree and had a pretty solid night of sleep. Probably the best one I'd had out there. This was also the night I got some emails actually that's what they call them. But there was a messaging system through their um, website. And so some friends and family reached out, sent me some nice encouraging messages, which was really nice because I'm having a hard time here. I'm kind of in the thick of it. I'm really just struggling to embrace and chat with people, but it's just really hard to be so regimented from not really doing adventures or races in this style or anything this long. And being having a massive lack of calories really was uh, adding up and starting to hurt too. So it was nice to to see those, went to sleep, and it was going to be the last runnable, no, the last marathon day. So we have, let's see, we've done 50K on the first day, a 26-mile day on the second day, a 53-mile day on the third day, and then off day on the fourth day. 26 ish mile day on the fifth day just finished that in this story and now we have a 26 mile day and then an eight mile day so wake up to the trumpets hooray so fun to wake up to blaring trumpets and billy joel basically playing all morning way too loud and i just sit around i'm kind of out of real breakfast food to eat so i'm having like a pinch of sunflower seeds um, a little bit of honey I actually had a keto brick too which i was rationing which work pretty good. Uh, it's like a thousand calories in like five ounces. So that that's pretty good stats. If you're into the FKT world, I'll have to consider that in the future. And it's mostly like coconut oil uh, type calories and stuff. That's how it's so dense. So Matt at this point is in second place by like two minutes I, or no third place by like two minutes. I'm pretty secure in second place by like an hour or two. And so I was like, Matt, like we've become pretty good friends after spending so much time together. It's like, Matt, let's just run together. Just stick with me. We'll try to knock this out. So we start off really hot. We're running like 830s in there through Slot Canyon. So it's really fun. Like the walls are like 50 feet up on each side and only like five feet wide down there. It's nice and cool in the canyon. We're just crushing through this. And then I roll my ankle. It was like one of those kind of bad rolls, but you just brush it off because it's in the runnable section. So it's like, oh, well, I'll worry about this later. So I was able to keep running. And then we get to these ladders where 
uh, actually search and rescues out there to help us get down the ladders and you down climb down them. One of them was like probably a 25 foot ladder and you just climb slowly down it and then you keep running. So there were four of them throughout the canyon as we went through. They called it Peekaboo Canyon, but I don't think it's the true Peekaboo Canyon that uh, you all know and love in the Escalante area region. So we go through the ladders and then it's like sandy roadbed for a long time. It's the kind of sand that is hard to run, but you can keep a 12 or 13 minute mile, but your heart rate skyrockets. So that's kind of what I felt and tried to keep it in check at this point. We're maybe halfway or so and Matt falls off pace a little bit. Michael comes up from behind. We thought we'd put some time on him, but uh, Michael was just a crusher. He was really fun too. So it was cool to see him do so well. And then it takes off into, there's no trail, just follows this dry creek bed. I think I don't think it's Kanab Creek, maybe, uh, but it's like it's below, it's above where the water is coming out. So it's completely dry, but you just run up this creek bed. There's a few ATV tracks, but you just follow it all the way up, probably like a four or five mile climb, getting pretty hot up to the top of this plateau where there's a checkpoint, fill up the water, and then it's the worst runnable grade you can imagine. It's like slight uphill, maybe five or 6% for the rest of the day. Where you should run, you can run, but it hurts to run. It's also, this may have actually been the hottest day. It was probably like 95 or something. So really good heat training. I did pretty good with heat management, but I tried to run as many miles as I could, but it turned into like a run walk thing where like walk just a little bit and then run as far as I could walk a little run as far as I could. And it stretched forever because the trees were gone. There was a few off-road sections where you just climb this lava rock really steep up and down cross country and then you join another road and then you just keep running slight uphill the whole time I uh, get to the last checkpoint and I can see the hill I go over and it's in the distance and a long ways away it's they said it was only like five or six miles from that last checkpoint to the finish but it felt like a million just because it was so hot and brutal it was just one of those like pure sun exposure days i I had a couple bloody noses at this point, just the dry air. It was all getting to me, but this is the last long day. I want to close it out well. So I ran as hard as I could, even up the uh, steeper parts if I could, or like short hiking breaks, topical cooling, drinking as much water as I can. But I have like no food. I I had three gels for this 26.3 miles, and it was like 2,500 feet of gain or so on this day. So it was rough. I'm drastically underfueled, and I don't have much to fuel with later. But I finally make it. I run. There's like this short runnable downhill into the fit. And so wait there, watch people coming in. I think I finished that marathon in like five hours, with which I felt really good about, especially carrying a pack and stuff. My pack's really light, so I'm able to move pretty darn quick. And yeah, people came in, finished. Everyone's happy because we only have about eight miles left on the final day. And just sat around, talked, and then set up camp in... Uh, kind of the the weeds in the shrubs. I graded out a nice little spot with my foot and slept outside again. It was really nice. And then in the morning, like little vole kept poking its head out, like inquiring about food or trying to get at something. But it was like, sorry, dude, I don't have any food for myself either. We're both going to be hungry this morning. So wake up and then they kind of announced when we're all going. They staggered the start so that we'd all finish the entire race about the same time. So the first wave left at 8.30, second wave at 9.30, and of course, I'm in the last wave, which left at 10.30. So that was pretty hard, once again, to sit around into the heat. And on this last day, the route was you ran back the way you'd come, down the big hill that I'd been dreading the day before, and then to a cone where you turned around and then ran all the way to the finish. So it was like five... Yeah, probably five true miles. And then three miles of the day was an out and back covering what we'd done the previous day for an eight mile total day. So we finally started at 1030. I had had like half a gel for breakfast and was going to eat one right when it started and then one halfway through just to like not bonk or fade too much. I mean, had enough of a lead, but I still wanted to leave it all out there. So I started off right behind Muriel, who won the whole thing and kept with him uh, through the turnaround point. We're running like every hill. It's brutal. It's getting hotter. 
my body is aching, my stomach is growling, I do not feel good, I haven't been that underfueled in a long time, and this was done on purpose, which is probably a harder way to uh, get through it, knowing that you, that I knew I was going to feel like this on this day. So about three miles from the finish, I just could not keep up anymore, and so I dropped back about a minute and a half or so and sprinted in through the finish. I did the final eight miles with 1,000, 1,200 feet of gain in an hour and seven minutes, so I was able to average like 830s with the pack on, felt good about it, and uh, secured second place. I got a belt buckle, a handshake, and they had pizza and soda at the end, so I was able to replenish some calories that I'd been lacking for three days. And then from there, you wait around, cheer everyone in, take some photos, and then we got a ride back to Kanab, where there was an awards banquet, which was pretty insane. So it was like a big party. It was almost like a, like the rich kids party, birthday party or something in middle school. There was a DJ, there were lights, there was a alcohol, there was like salmon, steak, uh, high-end salad. It was pretty extensive. And then they gave out a bunch of awards and uh, it was pretty cool. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was a lot. It's not usually the type of event or party or after race banquet that races usually have, but I got my second place award. It's pretty big block of like stone with a label that says second overall or something. But every award they announced, because it would be like, uh, and today, and the award for first place in the men's category 50 to 60 Matt Graham and then everyone would like cheer really loud like people were banging on tables and it was like obnoxious and for someone who can get overly stimulated it was a lot to get through and they gave out awards for every age group uh overall and then a bunch of special awards they did a 50 minute slideshow it went on for a long time but eventually uh got to the point where you were allowed to mingle again, and I called it a night. Went back to the hotel, went to bed, all set, grand to grand, 2024, done. But the real fun starts the next day. So at the banquet, uh, one of the volunteers, Dan, had invited me and Derek to come out on his uh, and fly in his plane, his Cessna. So we went out at 8 a.m. the next morning, got in the plane, took off. Derek's in the back seat. I'm in the co-pilot seat and we fly around. It's really cool. But then we start flying through canyons. Like the walls are above us and we're just like flying through them. Then we turn back like after 30 minutes or so of just like a huge smile on my face. It was so fun. It was like this tiny little plane and we're just flying. Uh, and he's like 85 years old and has been flying for like 60, 60 years, 65 years. 68 years, something like that. So pretty, pretty experienced. And we get back where we can kind of see Kanab and he's like, all right, you take over. And I grab the controls and I fly the plane. He's like, that's the runway over there. Square us up to the center, center line on the landing strip. So I turn us around a wide turn, point us at it. And I'm going down a little bit and he's flipping some levers and we're getting closer and closer. And I'm like, I am not qualified to land this. I hope he knows what he's doing. And we're going in. He's flipping some more things. He's not even touching the controls. And then we touch down and he takes over and we landed the plane. It was the coolest thing I've ever done. I had like a natural high after getting to land a plane. So that is my recap of the Grand to Grand stage race. Um, maybe I'll do an episode on things I'd change or something, but I guess... Uh, overall, the pack worked pretty good. The Hyperlite Aero 28. Uh, I probably get something more specialized. All the so there were 13 countries, probably like seven or eight people from France. So they had all very specialized gear. I think more designed for stage racing in general and gators and stuff. So if I was going to do another, I'd probably dive into some lighter, more specialized gear and really embrace that and maybe know the course a little bit better. Food planning. I don't know. I think I would have had a more holistic plan for maybe denser calories at the end or something, but maybe pre-packaging the weight so I knew what was going to be in it at the end of each day because the penalty was so stiff in not having enough weight. So that is the recap. Thank you for 
tuning in once again. Uh, Five-star reviews on Apple and Spotify are awesome. And thank you guys so much. And until next time, stay elite, my friends. <laughs>